Hello and welcome back to Weird on the Rocks. This is a podcast that explores the weird, unusual, strange, and unexplained, all while getting our drink on. I'm your host, Katie. Today I'm going to be discussing a topic that has fascinated me for years and was one of the first topics I put down on my list when I decided to start this podcast, and that is the Dyatlov Pass incident. This is one of the world's most famous unsolved mysteries, and although it took place over 60 years ago now, nobody still knows the truth behind what actually happened. Usually, I cover topics that have some kind of closure or explanation, um, but this story is yet to find an answer. If you Google the Dyatlov Pass, you will find a variety of videos, articles, and forums, all of which seem to have a different opinion on what they think happened. However, it's all just opinion because experts, investigators, historians, and even the Russian government claim to still have no idea what the actual chain of events were when it comes to this incident. If you've heard about this before, I hope I can contribute some new information that you haven't heard. Um, and if you have never heard of this event, buckle up because it's definitely a crazy ride. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about the individuals who were involved, the investigation and evidence found, and the various theories that surround this incident. Before we get going, I want to share another podcast promo for you guys. This one is from Travis over at the TM Podcast, so let's listen to his trailer. Hey, I'm Travis with the TM Podcast, and I hope you're enjoying this episode of Weird on the Rocks. When you're done, come join me at the TM Podcast, and let's talk about true crime. I go over all of the big cases like Richard Ramirez, Ted Bundy, and the Green River Killer, but I also go over the ones that are unheard of or controversial, like the case of Kanika Jenkins or the unsolved case of Heather Teague. You can find the TM Podcast on all streaming podcast services, as well as all social media networks. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Weird on the Rocks. All right, Travis, thanks for sending that over. If you want to find my show, I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Weird on the Rocks Podcast, Twitter at Weird underscore Rocks, and the website, weirdontherocks.weebly.com. Before we get into the good stuff tonight, I want to share this week's beverage of choice. In honor of the Dyatlov Pass incident, which happened in the former Soviet Union, I'm going to drink a classic Moscow mule. This drink consists of vodka, ginger beer, and lime juice. Um, I'm not being authentic with it because I cannot stand the feel of those copper mugs that these are usually served in. I honestly don't even like looking at them because it makes my skin crawl and ugh, it just feels like nails on a chalkboard for me. I don't know if anyone else has anything similar, but there's certain metals that I don't like to touch and copper is one of them. I'm just drinking this in a regular glass tonight. Please don't come for me if you're a Moscow mule purist because I'm probably um, really disappointing you right now, but I still think that they're delicious without the gross copper mug. So this is one of my favorite drinks um, and I thought it was perfect for this episode. All right, well, cheers and let's get weird. In 1959, a group of 10 individuals, eight men and two women, set out on a hiking and skiing expedition across the Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union. The group was formed by Igor Dyatlov, a 23-year-old radio engineering student at the Ural Polytechnical Institute. Most of the members of the group were fellow students at the Institute. All of them were experienced grade two hikers and would receive their grade three certification upon the completion of this expedition, the highest level in the Soviet Union. Getting a grade three certification consisted of traveling at least 186 miles in a hike that lasts a minimum of 16 days, half of which has to be done in uninhabited territory, and 62 
miles of the hike must be done in difficult terrain. The goal of this expedition was to reach a mountain seven miles away called Gora Atorton, which means don't go there in the Mansi language, and it was estimated to take them 16 days round trip. The plan was to reach their final destination, a village called Vizhe, and make contact with those back home via telegram before starting the trip back. However, none of these 10 individuals would ever reach their destination, and 61 years later, we still don't know what happened to them. The members of the hiking team consisted of eight men and two women, all between the ages of 20 and 37. All of these individuals have Russian names, so I'm going to do my best to pronounce them correctly. Their names were Ludmila Dubinina, age 20, Rostim Slobodin, age 23, Alexander Kolevitov, age 24, Semyon Zolotaryov, age 37, Zineda Komogorova, age 22, Igor Dyatlov, age 23, Nikolai Vladimirovich, age 23, Yuri Yudin, age 21, Yuri Doroshenko, age 21, and Yuri Krivonshenko, age 23. As you can tell, Yuri is a very popular name over there and is actually the Russian version of George, so three of them were named Yuri. All of them, with the exception of Simeon, age 37, were students at the Ural Polytechnical Institute, were members of the school's hiking team and mostly majored in scientific fields such as engineering and hydraulics. Simeon was the only outsider who had not hiked with the group beforehand. He was planning a hiking expedition with another group, but when plans fell through, Igor Dyatlov invited him to hike with his group instead. All of the hikers were very experienced, were familiar with hiking protocol and regulations, and were very comfortable in the outdoors. The group loved to write poetry, play games, dance, and play music, and they even brought a mandolin along with them to play on their downtime. They also enjoyed writing and actually were hoping to make a little newspaper about their trip once they returned home and took many photos with the intention of them being included in this paper. Although the majority of the group were young college kids who liked to have fun, they took this expedition very seriously. They did not bring alcohol or cigarettes and, as journalist Nathan Chandler said, quote, it wasn't a vacation, it was a mission, end quote. Igor Dyatlov, who the Dyatlov Pass would eventually be named after, was the leader of the group. At the young age of 23, he was very respected and admired at the Ural Polytechnical Institute, and especially admired within the hiking club. He was incredibly intelligent and considered to be the person you would go to with any questions regarding hiking or skiing. In fact, the same group had once been on a hiking expedition when a stampede of wild horses charged them. Amidst the chaos, Igor directed the group to huddle together in a tight circle with their backs to the horses, and they ran right around them. Their journey began on January 25th, 1959, where they had to take a train to the town of Ivdel, and then a truck to the village of Vizhai, which is the last village to the north. There they spent the night and ate several loaves of bread to give themselves energy for the hike they would begin the next day. They started the trip on horse and sleigh, then eventually switched to skiing and the horse returned to town. Within a day, team member Yuri Yudin began to feel very unwell. Yuri had rheumatism as well as a congenital heart defect and began to experience intense knee and joint pain. He decided to turn back while the other nine continued on their journey. The group utilized journals as well as several cameras to document their trip. The first few days, they traveled on relatively flat land, utilizing the skis they had brought along, and everything seemed to be going as planned. Photos later recovered from their cameras show the group smiling and posing, hugging, laughing, skiing, sitting around the fire, and writing in their journals. One photo even showed one of the young men playing in the snow, pretending to be dead, as a joke. Their journals were also recovered and were mostly full of notes explaining what they were doing, what they were eating, how they were putting up the tent, etc. One of the individuals, Zenaida, or called Zena, wrote in her journal, quote, I wonder what awaits us on this hike. Will anything new happen? End quote. On February 1st, six days into their trip, they reached the foot of what is referred to by locals as Dead Mountain. And it was given this name because the mountain is very desolate and hunters have never seen any game in the area. 
they started their climb up and began to move through the pass. Their plan was to go through the pass and set up camp on the other side, but weather conditions were worsening quickly and it appears that they lost their direction and instead went west and higher up Dead Mountain. For unknown reasons, the group decided to set up camp a few hundred yards from the peak of Dead Mountain, which caused many to believe that they had realized their mistake and wanted to stop as soon as possible. However, while the area they decided to make their camp on wasn't a big incline, it was a very open area, exposing them to the elements. Less than a mile downhill from them was a forested area which would have probably provided them some shelter from the gusting snowstorms, and it is unclear why they did not set up camp there instead. Later, Yuri Yudin, the man who had turned back, speculated that, quote, Dyatlov probably did not want to lose the altitude they had gained, or he decided to practice camping on the mountain slope. End quote. Yudin believes that Igor, being the type who always wanted to push his limits, thought that camping in the open area would challenge the group. That night, the last journal entry would be written, which said, quote, It is difficult to imagine such comfort on the ridge, with shrill howling winds and hundreds of kilometers away from human settlement. End quote. The group had told those back home that they should expect a telegram from the town of Vizhai no later than February 12th. However, Igor Dyatlov had told Yuri Yudin that he expected it to be a day or two longer. On February 12th, there was no news from the group, but their families did not immediately become concerned. However, by February 16th, families and students and staff of the college started to worry that something had happened to their loved ones, and they wanted to start searching for them. However, they wanted this search to include the head instructor of the school's hiking club, who happened to be away at the time. The families did not seem to be in a serious rush because they waited for him to return before they began their search on February 20th, eight days after they were supposed to have been heard from. The search group consisted mostly of fellow students and teachers from the Polytechnic Institute. Finally, after several days of searching in the freezing temperatures and deep snow, the search team found the group's campsite. However, what they found there has never been explained. The first thing the searchers saw was the tent, slightly collapsed and partially covered with snow. None of the nine hikers were in sight. Upon further inspection, it was discovered that the tent had several large slash marks in the side, which had been made from inside the tent, but the front zipper was still zipped up and locked. The tent was made from a very heavy-duty canvas material, and cutting holes in the side would have been difficult. The packs and belongings from the group were all still inside the tent. Nine pairs of shallow footprints were seen in the snow, which led the search team down the mountain into the wooded area. Although the footprints were shallow and very clear to the eye, they started out in disarray, appearing as if they calmly scattered as they exited the tent. However, as the footprints went on, they became more orderly and looked as though they were walking in a single file line. Down in the wooded area, they discovered the remains of a small campfire, and under a cedar tree, the bodies of Yuri Doroshenko and Yuri Krivonoshenko. Both men were barefoot and only wearing thin shirts and underwear. Yuri Krivonoshenko had also bitten off the skin on his knuckle, which investigators believe was to shock himself into staying alive or to stifle a cry. Medical analysis revealed that both men died of hypothermia. The cedar tree had broken branches up to 15 feet high, leading the search party to believe the men had climbed the tree to try and see their camp, or were trying to flee from something. Between the cedar tree and the camp, searchers found three more bodies, that of Igor, Zaneda, and Rustin. These three were wearing jackets and pants, but were still missing gloves, hats, and shoes. All three were facing the direction of their camp and in positions that made searchers believe they were attempting to return to their camp. All three also died of hypothermia. Igor Dyatlov was found with his hands and fists clutched to his chest, and his jacket was left unbuttoned. He was also found wearing a watch that had stopped at 531. After the discovery of these five bodies, it took searchers another two months to find the remaining four hikers, who were all found buried under 13 feet of snow in a ravine about 300 feet from the wooded area. 
they were wearing more clothing than the original hikers that were found, and it appeared that they actually took clothing from those who had died first in order to keep themselves warm. Ludmila's foot was wrapped in Yuri Krivonoshenko's burned, torn pants, and Simeon was wearing Ludmila's coat. However, these last members of the team, who appeared to have survived longer than the first who were found, died in more violent and mysterious ways. During autopsies, it was revealed that Nikolai Vladimirovich died from several skull fractures. Lunmila and Simeon both had severe chest trauma, including broken ribs, that was not apparent externally, but was only discovered during the autopsy. The medical examiner said that these types of chest fractures were usually seen in victims of car crashes due to immense force and pressure. Simeon also had his eyes missing, and Ludmila, who was found face down in a small creek, had severe internal bleeding, one eye missing, and her tongue was missing. The official report also stated that several articles of clothing, two shirts and a pair of pants, had unusually high levels of radiation present. Several of the group members also appeared to have darker skin than when they began their trip, and two of them had hair that appeared to be bleached. All the members of the group appeared to have died six to nine hours after their last meal, and none of them were intoxicated or found to have drugs or medicine of any sort in their systems. The first explanation that the Soviet government relayed to the public was that the group died from hypothermia. This was the belief due to the individuals being found in the snow in little clothing. 25% of sufferers of hypothermia remove articles of clothing, something called paradoxical undressing, which is caused by the brain malfunctioning, telling the body it is too hot when it's actually too cold. However, as the autopsies came back and more investigations were conducted, it was clear that hypothermia could not have caused all of the injuries seen. And it didn't answer the core question of why these young adults left their tent in the middle of the night. However, the Soviet government, which was under communist rule at the time, did not dig deeper into this incident. Almost immediately, they closed the case due to the absence of a guilty party. They claimed that these individuals' deaths were caused by the, quote, spontaneous power of nature, end quote, but never explained what that natural force might have been. The Soviet government also did not care to offer any answers to the families of the deceased and pushed them to hold a combined private funeral quickly without any public knowledge. However, somehow two flyers were posted that shared the time and place of the funeral and thousands of people showed up to pay their respects. Today, a large monument with the names and faces of the nine hikers stands in the Mihailovsko Cemetery. In February of 2019, the Russian government decided to reopen the Dyatlov case and re-examine the evidence, although no news has been reported on this yet. So what happened to these young, vibrant, smart, experienced hikers? What would cause all of them to flee their safe tent in such a hurry as to cut slashes in the side instead of exiting through the front? Why did they not have on appropriate clothing, no hats, gloves, or shoes? And why did some of them die from unexplained violent injuries? The truth is, we still don't know what happened that night on that mountain. However, many theories have been analyzed in the 61 years since this tragic event took place. Today, I'm going to discuss 11 of these theories, although there are even more you can find online. The first and perhaps most widely believed theory is that their deaths were caused by an avalanche. This theory suggests that while the group was asleep in their tent, they heard the far-off sound of an avalanche approaching or felt the rumble of the ground shaking beneath them. In a panic, they did not have time to find the key for the tent zipper or get dressed, and instead slashed open the side of the tent and ran out into the snow in what they were wearing. They ran as far as possible to get out from in front of the avalanche, but were not able to make it back to their camp and froze in the elements. Many think that their tent itself could point to an avalanche, as it was found slightly collapsed with a thin layer of snow covering it. In a 2014 article by author Benjamin Radford, he says, quote, The group woke up in a panic and cut their way out of the tent either because an avalanche had covered the entrance to their tent or because they were scared that an avalanche was imminent. Better to have a potentially repairable slit in a tent than risk being buried alive in it from tons of snow. 
They were poorly clothed because they had been sleeping and ran to the safety of the nearby woods where trees would help slow oncoming snow. In the darkness of night, they got separated into two or three groups. One group made a fire, while the others tried to return to the tent to recover their clothing, since the danger had apparently passed. But it was too cold, and they all froze to death before they could locate their tent in the darkness. At some point, some of the clothes may have been recovered or swapped from the dead. But at any rate, the group of four, whose bodies were most severely damaged, were caught in an avalanche and buried under four meters of snow. More than enough to account for the compelling natural force that the medical examiner described. End quote. However, many have pointed out some huge holes in this theory. First is that studies conducted on the mountain in the 61 years since the event have found that the slope on which the group was camping was not at an incline steep enough for an avalanche. Some studies also found that if there was an avalanche, the trajectory of it would have missed the group's camp and their tent. More than 100 expeditions have since been taken to the same area, none of which experienced avalanches or observed any signs of previous ones. In fact, the journal entries from the group that day mentioned that the snow layer was quite thin on the night they died with no new snowfall. Many also point out that although the tent did have a layer of snow covering it and was partially collapsed, an avalanche would have completely covered it and knocked it down. There would also be other signs of an avalanche just occurring, such as debris left over. An avalanche picks up rocks and branches as it moves, and these remnants would be found surrounding the camp. Those who knew Igor Dyatlov, the leader of the group, also stated that he was a very experienced mountaineer and he would never have allowed his group to camp somewhere unsafe. The avalanche theory also does not explain the fact that the footprints leading away from the tent were found to be shallow and clear and did not appear to be from people who were in a rushed panic fleeing from an avalanche. There are also several theories about the Soviet government being involved in the tragic event. One of these theories suggests that one or several of the men on the expedition were actually members of the KGB. The KGB was a government security agent for the Soviet Union and was active from 1954 to 1991. Some believe that someone on the trip was a spy for the KGB or possibly even the CIA, whose goal was to take these young adults out into the wilderness, extract information from them, and then kill them in ways that couldn't be traced back to them. Many pointed the finger at Simeon Zolotaryov because he was much older than the rest of the group, didn't know any of them, and joined the group at the last minute when his regular hiking group wasn't available. Simeon also a veteran with many years of combat experience and had at one time in his life worked for a secret scientific facility in Moscow. Some see these things as strange and believe that he could possibly have infiltrated the hiking group and was helping the Soviet or American government in some way. Another theory is that the group accidentally found themselves near some secret military testing. Specifically, some believe that parachute mine exercises were taking place on the mountain, which is when mines are dropped by parachute from an aircraft. The group perhaps was asleep in their tent when they heard loud noises near, and they rushed out as quickly as possible, slashing the tent open instead of fussing with the locked zipper. They could have retreated too far and died trying to return to camp. Some also believe that the second group of victims that were found and were believed to have survived the longest could have died from these parachute mine tests. The mines explode in the air before they hit the ground, and falling debris could have caused the internal bleeding and chest trauma found. There's also documentation that the Soviet Union often conducted these tests in similar terrain, and doing these tests on this mountain would not have been unusual. There's also the theory that the group actually found themselves near some nuclear testing instead. This could explain the items of clothing that were found with high levels of radiation on them and could also possibly explain the individuals who were found with discolored hair and skin. In fact, the pilot who flew the corpses back into town wouldn't load the bodies into his plane until he knew they were all placed in zinc bags, which would stop the spread of the radiation. Another odd detail is that there were more than 30 witnesses in towns nearby who claimed to have seen glowing orange balls in the sky the night that the group died. The balls supposedly moved slowly and took about 10 minutes to cover the skyline. Some members of the search party who later looked for the group also claimed to have seen these glowing balls. So were these glowing balls in the sky somehow connected to some military or nuclear testing? 
Another theory is that the hikers were killed by escaped prisoners from a nearby gulag or were mistaken for escaped prisoners themselves. Gulags were forced labor camps in the Soviet Union that reached their peak during Stalin's reign from the 1930s to the early 1950s. These camps included individuals responsible for a variety of crimes from petty theft to political crimes. In my research, I found several articles that claimed there was a gulag in the vicinity of where the incident occurred, but I could not find any specifics on how close it was. Some believe that perhaps some prisoners escaped and decided to kill the group, although there were no records of any escaped criminals from any of the surrounding gulags, and killing the group wouldn't have benefited them in any way. It wasn't a robbery that escalated as none of their belongings were found stolen. Another theory is that gulag guards were scanning the area, saw the group, and killed them thinking they were escaped prisoners. However, this does not explain why they left their tent in the first place, the various ways they died, or the radiation found on some of the clothing. There are also several theories that suggest that some kind of natural disaster or element is what killed the nine hikers. One of these theories is that something known as catabatic wind was the cause of their deaths. According to the site dyatlovpass.com, quote, Catabatic comes from the Greek word for descending and is a type of wind that can happen when cold air over a glacier or a mountainous area starts to flow down a gradient. The phenomenon can also be described as a ball rolling downhill by gravity, hence it is also labeled a gravity wind, a wind that carries high-density air from a higher elevation down a slope. The definition of a catabotic wind is sometimes also referred to as a fall wind. Since cooled air has a higher density than the surrounding atmosphere, the catabotic wind can sometimes accelerate to the force of a hurricane. End quote. A catabotic wind of this magnitude would have made it impossible for the group to remain inside their tent, and most likely they would have to flee in a hurry. These winds can be extremely violent, perhaps causing the group to flee quickly and disperse in a panic, as well as possibly causing the variety of injuries that were found. In 1978, Eight hikers were killed in Sweden as the result of a catabotic wind, and a 2019 expedition to the location of the Dyatlov Pass incident noted that this mountain and the mountain where those eight hikers had been killed had very similar topography. Another natural occurrence that might have killed the group is something called infrasound. In the 2013 book by Donnie Eicher titled Dead Mountain, he hypothesized that the intense wind on the mountain could have created something called a Carmen vortex streak, which is a repeated pattern of swirling vortexes. This phenomenon can cause infrasound so high-pitched that it creates a panic and disorientation in humans. Infrasound is so high-pitched that us humans can't actually hear it, but it can cause feelings of distress, doom, confusion, and physical pain. Infrasound has even been used in non-lethal military weapons to disorient enemies, and pirate boats still to this day use it to divert other boats from heading their direction. In 2017, a study was conducted in Ireland that tested the effects of infrasound on humans. The experiment consisted of 750 people at a concert where, without their knowledge, some of the music played included infrasound. After the concert, the audience was interviewed and asked questions about how the music made them feel. 22% of the concert goers reported feelings of being sorrowful, nervous, upset, and repulsed. Professor Richard Wiseman, who conducted the study, said, quote, These results suggest that low-frequency sound can cause people to have unusual experiences, even though they cannot consciously detect infrasound, end quote. The infrasound theory suggests that the group was asleep in the tent when this noise began to happen, causing them to panic and become disoriented, and possibly have the urge to hurt themselves. Perhaps they left the tent in a hurry, fleeing into the night without a plan, and died before they could return. However, this does not explain the radiation found, the tongue missing, the injuries of extreme force and internal bleeding, or the shallow and calm footprints in the snow. It is also unlikely that all the group members would have experienced this phenomena, as studies such as the concert one show that only a percentage of people experience these feelings. However, some also believe that maybe only a few of the group members were affected by the catabotic wind or infrasound, they left the tent in a panic, and the rest died from following them into the snow and trying to help. 
Along with these theories are countless more that perhaps don't have as much reasoning or evidence behind them, but are more mythical and supernatural in nature. There is the theory that the group was actually killed by Bigfoot, or a Yeti as they are called in Russia. One of the main reasons behind this theory is because one of the cameras from the trip contained a photo that cannot be explained. This photo was the last one taken on the camera of Nikolai Vladimirovich, in which you can see a large figure peeking out from behind a tree. The photo is blurry and taken from far away, and no face can be detected. In fact, one journal entry written by a group member said, quote, Now we know snowmen exist, end quote. However, some believe that this entry could have been written jokingly and actually was part of their pretend newspaper they planned on creating when they returned. Perhaps they took that photo of one of them peering out from behind the tree, wrote the journal entry, and later hoped to use it as a funny story. Many believe that the Yeti theory is only making light of this tragedy and trying to blame their deaths on something based in fantasy. A theory has also been presented that blames aliens and UFOs for their deaths. Some speculate that the orange glowing balls in the sky were actually UFOs, and the aliens did some sort of testing on the group and then left them for dead. This could explain the fact that there were no other footprints found, that they had to leave the tent in a panic when they saw the bright lights outside, and it could even possibly explain the radiation found on some of the clothing. Also, the very last photo that was taken on one of their cameras that night shows some sort of out-of-focus object which cannot be identified. Some believe that this photo was a clue of some sort and perhaps captured a UFO. The head investigator of the area after the event, Lev Ivanov, recalled that some of the trees around their camp also appeared to be burned at the very top, which could possibly have been caused by alien crafts hovering above the trees. Ivanov also said years later that he was forced by the Soviet government to take out any mentions of the orange balls or burned trees from his official report. However, most believe this to also be a far-fetched story and again, see it as making light of a serious tragedy. Another theory that is mentioned online is that perhaps they were killed by the Mansi people who were native to the area. Perhaps the group was somewhere they weren't supposed to be or saw something they weren't supposed to see. However, the Mansi people have never been known to be violent and actually are very secluded, and no known crime has been reported in the area in over three decades. Reindeer hunters who frequented the mountain said they had never had anything but positive experiences with the locals, and that they even allowed them to stay in their homes one night during a storm. The Mansi people have also said that Dead Mountain was not a sacred area to them and held no importance. So the idea that they were killed because they were disrespecting the land just doesn't make sense. There is also another theory that includes a small cooking stove that the group brought with them that was actually designed and built by Igor Dyatlov. This theory suggests that the group set the stove up and it began to smoke uncontrollably and they had to flee in a hurry. Many bring up the fact that cutting the tent from the inside points to something happening inside the tent that they needed to flee from, not something from outside the tent. It is possible that the stove malfunctioned and they couldn't breathe and needed to get out as fast as possible. Also, one of the last photos taken from the day prior show one of the group members smiling, wearing a jacket that appears to have been burned in several places. Perhaps the stove was prone to malfunctioning. However, when the stove was found, it did not appear to have any smoke residue, and this also wouldn't explain why they traveled so far from the camp. If they were simply trying to get away from the smoke, they would most likely just go right outside the tent, and there would be no reason for them to scatter so far. And the last theory I'm going to discuss is that perhaps the group was actually intoxicated and that something went wrong. Some speculate that there is no way a group of college kids would go into the mountains without bringing some alcohol or drugs. Perhaps they did some drugs such as mushrooms, acid, or LSD, and things took a turn for the worst. It could even be that one member had an adverse reaction and began to become violent or delusional, and that the rest of the group had to get away from them as quickly as possible. Although no alcohol or drug paraphernalia was found in the camp, and none of the individuals had any foreign substances in their body, 
Some believe that the Soviet government simply removed these details from the reports in order to save the reputation of the group as well as the Soviet Union as a whole. The Soviet Union, a government which was extremely proud and did not like to admit mistakes, could have wanted the hiking group to be seen as a wholesome group of Soviet citizens who represented the country in a positive light and not some partying college kids. However, everyone close to the group members say that they were responsible, smart, logical people and they wouldn't jeopardize their hard work by partaking in drugs on their trip. The only surviving member, Yuri Yudin, also was adamant that they did not bring any drugs or alcohol on the trip with them. Yudin, who died in 2003 at the age of 75, said that he always felt extreme guilt for leaving his friends behind and not being with them on that fateful night and he visited the cemetery where the monument was every February 2nd to pay his respects to his friends. After his death, he was buried next to the Dyatlov Pass monument. Yudin did not believe that his friends died from a natural occurrence because there were too many strange details that did not add up. He instead believed that the group died from some sort of military testing or exposure from nuclear testing. Of course, as with any unsolved mystery, there are people who doubt Yudin's story and believe that he was working with the government and knew more than he was telling. As I mentioned previously, last year the Russian government decided to reopen the Dyatlov case. However, they are not indulging all theories, but only ones that involve some sort of natural event. Alexander Kurinoy, the official representative of Russia's Prospector General, has stated that only theories that include natural phenomena will be investigated, and any theories dealing with the government, UFOs, Yetis, military testing, or criminal activity will not be looked into. Along with these 11 theories I discussed, there are countless others online, many of which people have combined several of these theories into a sequence of events they see as plausible. However, I haven't found one theory that explains all of the details of this case. Many of the theories have explanations for some of the details but still have major holes and can't create a reasonable explanation for the entire night and the behavior of the group members. 61 years later, and experts, historians, journalists, experienced hikers, and the public still do not have a plausible theory into what killed these young, healthy, experienced hikers that night. Personally, I don't have a theory that I completely buy. It seems like every time a theory makes sense, there is a detail that just doesn't fit, and I start all over from square one. I find that while many of the theories could be plausible, most of them don't answer the question of why they left the tent in such a hurry, causing them to slash holes in the side. Many of the theories also don't explain the range of injuries the group members sustained, or the radiation found on some of the clothing. With unsolved cases like this, I usually follow the rule of Occam's razor, which is a principle that states, quote, when presented with competing hypotheses that make the same predictions, one should select the solution with the fewest assumptions, end quote. Basically, that the simplest solution is usually the correct one. As much as things like this event are fun to speculate about and create conspiracies around, I think that the death of these hikers wasn't anything supernatural or criminal in nature. However, I always come back to the beginning of this event and the fact that they slashed holes in the tent and left in a panic, being partly undressed and walking out into the freezing temperatures. I believe that something happened inside the tent while they were getting undressed for the night, and that is why they were poorly dressed and not wearing their shoes. I don't know what happened, but I think perhaps they heard something outside that made them in fear of staying in the tent, such as they thought an avalanche was coming and they wanted to move out of its trajectory, or they heard the noises of the parachute mines exploding, or the infrasound was making some of them physically and emotionally unstable, and they thought it was safest to leave the tent. Perhaps one of them was just going crazy and felt like they needed to leave the tent as quick as possible. They didn't want to deal with the zipper and they just cut holes in the side. Then the rest followed them out to help them. I think they headed down towards the wooded area and broke off tree branches to make a fire. After a while, several of them tried to return back to the tent to retrieve some supplies, knowing that the tent was no longer usable since there were holes slashed in the side. They then weren't able to return and froze to death on their way back. I have found online that some believe the remaining members tried to dig a trench or make a snow shelter of some sort and it collapsed on them, causing the extreme chest trauma and broken ribs with little external injury, which could happen from that much snow falling on you. 
Some believe they simply could have fallen off of an ice shelf and down into the ravine, and that the fall itself is what killed them and caused those injuries. And both of these theories definitely sound plausible to me. I believe that the group members who had darkened skin and bleached looking hair was simply due to being out in the elements for so long and they basically got an extreme sunburn and the sun lightened their hair. However, I have no explanation for what could have caused the missing tongue or eyeballs. Some speculate that Ludmila, whose tongue was missing, was also found face down in a stream, so perhaps the decomposition in the water caused her tongue to fall out. The tongue was never found, which could possibly be explained by animals eating it after her death. Some also speculate that Simeon's missing eyes could have also been from animals, but this would be very unusual for bears or wolves, which are the animals most common in the area. And maybe perhaps these animals were sick or in desperate need of food. I also have no explanation for the radiation found on some of the clothing, although I did find one source that stated that Alexander and Yuri Krivoshenko had both previously worked at nuclear power plants, and perhaps they were wearing clothes that had been worn to work at one time and had residual radiation on them. However, all of these theories and the countless ones found in YouTube videos and online forums are all that, just theories. The only people who truly know what happened that night died up there on Dead Mountain. I hope that the Russian government can be genuine and truthful in their investigation of this case and actually search for the truth and present it to the public, even if it possibly paints them in a negative light in some way. Although the immediate families of most of these people are no longer alive, I think that their relatives deserve to know what happened to their family members. And those young adults who lost their lives deserve justice, and they deserve for the truth of their deaths to be told. As always, I want to know what you guys think. Have you ever heard of the Dyatlov Pass, or was this your first time hearing of it? Do you have your own theory that I didn't include? This case can be such a rabbit hole if you allow it to be. I found so many interesting articles and people's theories, and you can just go on forever and have your theory change every single day because it really, truly doesn't make sense at the end. I want to know if you guys think something easily explainable happened to them, or do you think it was something criminal or supernatural in nature? Stories like this are so fascinating to think about and research, and this case just has so many odd details that I really, truly don't know if it'll ever be solved, but I really, really hope that it can be. As always, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Weird on the Rocks Podcast, Twitter at Weird underscore Rocks, and the website weirdontherocks.weebly.com. Please come out and chat with me and let me know your thoughts on this episode. Thank you, as always, for hanging out with me today. I appreciate every single one of you. And until next time, cheers and stay weird. was a Titan Gas episode.